I want to talk about the actual vehicle itself, particularly with the advantage that Tesla will have based on their experience with their the development of their high voltage architectures in the Model 3 and the Model Y. Sandy and I toured the Nikola factory and we saw how they were building those, the tray, the tray Bev truck and their hydrogen truck. And they were horrendously inefficient from an integration perspective. Um, so I have a feeling that the high voltage architectures of these Tesla semis are going to be phenomenal. And um, similarly with the Cybertruck, they're going to take everything that they've learned and apply that to the Cybertruck. So on Monroe Live, we're tearing these things down. So I'm just keenly interested in the actual execution of the, the vehicle itself. Did you hear them talk at all about the Cybertruck and being able to use the uh, megawatt charger? Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh. And we discovered the patent on the, the liquid cooled charging cable, I think in 2018 or 19. Um, so our team reads all the patents for Tesla, including the Octoval patents. So when we bought the uh, the Model Y and tore down the octo valve and the super manifold. We actually noticed that the patent was the patents were wide ranging and didn't actually cover the exact execution that was launched on the octo valve and on the super manifold. So we didn't know if the liquid cooled charging cable was like diversion tactics, um, but it's nice to hear that they're actually going to use it. So what are your thoughts on the issues as far as like we all know, right? The issues that happen whenever you're charging the battery especially as it gets closer to completion. I mean, obviously the chemistry dependencies change everything, but what are your what are your thoughts on the fact that we'd be able to use the same megawatt charger for the Cybertruck as for the Tesla or uh, the semi Tesla semi? Like I, I know we don't have a lot of details on yeah. it, but how do you see the so, math of that? Because I, I think a lot of people are going to get run away and like, "Oh, I can charge a semi a, a Cybertruck in 5 minutes." And for me, that's there's a lot yeah. missing there. So there's the chemistry limitations of lithium ion batteries and then the chemistry choice whether you're NCMA or lithium polymer, that actually varies your ability to charge. Then there's the choice of materials on the bus bars that can be limiting factors. So um, we're currently tearing down two EVs not related to Monroe Live and their choice of materials for bus bars and the layout of the, the modules themselves inside the battery pack. That's the limiting factor for uh, their ability to charge um, for heat dissipation and resistance buildup. Um, so oftentimes there's decision factors for cost that impact your ability to charge. And then um, the, the materials you're using in your onboard charge uh, some of the early EVs had really weak onboard chargers. I think you can still buy a Chevy Bolt. They can barely charge fast at all. I forget how weak they are. So it's the onboard charger is what I'm most interested in tearing down. And there's a lot of new um, there's a lot of new technology um, in the charging materials, particularly gallium nitride. If you're familiar with silicon, silicon carbide, and gallium nitride, there's actually a uh, a company that sells chargers like for your iPhone that charge faster in a really small package from Anchor, they're using gallium nitride. So we actually bought some of those to tear down to study the chips on those boards. I'll be really interested to see what the onboard charger looks like because that's typically your major limiting factor is the wattage that the onboard charger can handle and then how it talks to your your charging grid. So I, I had a Rivian R1S over the, over the break. It was a press vehicle from Rivian, VIN number 00140. I took it to charge at a EV Go charge place and I thought I was going to get 350 kilowatts and I got 80. And then it shut off after six minutes when I went into the mm. mall and I came out and it only got like like nothing. It was like the worst experience ever. Um, so you really have to have a nice relationship with your charging infrastructure. Otherwise, an amazing ability to charge and an amazing onboard charger is kind of irrelevant. I think Tesla is light years ahead with their charging infrastructure. And did you hear the part where they talked about using a thousand volt architecture? A thousand volt architecture or 800 volt architecture, there's some advantages uh, in your wire size. And you actually saw this on a smaller level when some OEMs switched from 12 volt to 48 volt systems for internal combustion engine vehicles. A lot of German OEMs did this, particularly for your high amperage systems like your steering rack, a couple of uh, your starter, uh, BSGs, belt start generators. This is before the move to, to EVs and mild hybrids. Real benefit there is cost reduction in wiring. So when you have a higher voltage, you can shrink the size of your wiring. You get a lot of advantages running higher voltages because uh, your bus bar sizing can drop. 
So the cost of those, they're not precious metals, but they're expensive metals. So throughout your battery pack and your high voltage electronics, you can uh, shrink the size of, of all your wiring and your connectors, which are a primary cost driver in high voltage architecture. And so since they're using the plaid motors as the drivetrain, and they talked about using the one for just steady state driving and then having the second and third that they could clutch in as needed. Are they are they operating those at the same voltage that they would be operating in the plaid and then just being able to run more basically not necessarily in parallel? The plaid system is a 400 volt system uh, or 360 volt nominal, about 400 volt system. So if you look at it, most diesel, diesel over the road trucks, they're actually low horsepower, high torque. The reason why they're most likely using the carbon fiber wrapped is because if they're getting a high amount of torque, they're spinning at a very high RPM. So if they're spinning at a very high RPM, they're generating a huge amount of torque. I don't know what the gear ratio will be, but it's got to be way over nine to one. So the gearboxes in most of the Teslas are like 9.046 to one. And they're almost all the same front and rear, Model Y, Model 3. We've torn down all of them. And I believe the plaid gear ratios are the same. The gear ratio in the semi is going to be completely different. I didn't even get a chance to catch it. You're going to be high torque, lower power, high RPM. That matches the amount of output that you would have from a very, very high torque, low horsepower inline six diesel engine is what you typically have. I mean, semis from the 1980s and 90s have less horsepower and about the same amount of torque as a modern inline six diesel engine from Cummins in like a Ram. It's incredible. I know this is an EV discussion, but you know, Monroe spent two decades studying internal combustion engine powertrains if you're trying to draw parallels between them. Any thoughts on FSD beta uh, version 11 coming out soon and 10.69.3? I'm biased. I live in a kind of geofenced air, not geofenced area, but I'm a, a echo chamber of my own geo where it works amazingly. Uh, just curious on your take on full self-driving autonomy on the whole, not just Tesla. I rode with John from Silicon Valley Tesla back in 2021 and that blew me what blew me away in Fremont. I think what's important for for people to realize about about FSD beta is I think Tesla's Tesla's lead is so great that many of the other OEMs I think are giving up for just That's all I want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't say who, but I, I live in Detroit. So I have lunches with friends and I've ran into two or three people from GM and I'm like, hey, where's my lyric? They've intimated that it's because the Super Cruise or the Ultra Cruise just isn't working right yet, you know, and they can't build them and they can't get it to work. And I, I'm not going to name names, but these are people who would know, you know, it's kind of embarrassing that you have these multi-billion dollar organizations that, that are this far behind. And I drive a GM product embarrassingly uh, i drive a yukon and it has it just has the ping pong thing where it bounces on the lines and it drives me crazy because i had the r1s for uh just like five or six days and even even rivian's is way better rivian actually lane yeah. keeps so i'm i'm really the wrong person to ask for the detailed fsd beta stuff i know that our our team uh, our model three that we own does will get it it should get it but we're in Michigan. So I'm not I'm not up to date on if we're going to get it in the right area or not. So yeah. sorry, I can't help you out there. I'm more of the hardware guy, not the software guy. 